Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Sorry I haven't posted in a little bit. I've been doing some traveling, seeing some family. Uh, good news is I am going to post a little bit more in the next coming weeks, and also I have another collaboration coming up, which is great because it means I'm yet again increasing my chances of accidentally doxing myself and getting fired at work. So if that happens, I'll be posting plenty more. Anyways, let's talk about time series databases. So what exactly is a time series database? Well, if you guess that it helps you handle graph data, you are a bozo and incorrect. It helps you handle time series data, which is really just a fancy way of saying any piece of data that you mainly care about the time series range that it's a part of. Basically any type of graph or line plot or anything like that. And so that could be logs, it could be metrics, it could be sensor readings, it could be any piece of data where the main access pattern that we want to use is accessing it by some sort of time range. And so there are many different types of time series databases. Uh, this video is most going to be inspired by Timescale DB, but there's also InfluxDB and Apache Druid. So feel free to look into those as well. So how is it that time series databases are going to allow us to optimize reads, writes, and actually as well, deletes? Let's start talking about them. So one way that it does things is pretty simple. We've spoken about this a lot on this channel, which is using column-oriented storage. So because time series databases will typically tend to include many different columns of data, but typically we only care about one or two at a time, using column-oriented storage ensures that we are only fetching the columns that we care about. It ensures that we're getting better data locality. And because we're only, say, fetching one column at a time instead of fetching an entire row at a time, we can do some handy things with compression and just improving our caching in general to make sure that our cache only contains the data that we want. So like I said, better disk locality can cache more, less data to fetch. Column-oriented storage, obviously going to help a lot in any type of analytical workflow, and time series databases are often going to be using that. So what else can we do to continue to optimize our reads? Okay, so this is something that is kind of unique to the time series database, and it is also going to help us a lot with both our writes and our deletes. And that is using something known as a hypertable. And so this is our hypertable right here. You can see we've got this three by three grid and each of these pieces of the grid, I will call a chunk table. So if you think about it for something like a time series database, the reason that we want to be using something like this is because we're effectively parameterizing our data by two main things. One is where it's coming from. So let's imagine we have some sensors, you know, you've got sensor one, sensor two and sensor three. And another typical thing that we would do is the actual range of time that that data belongs in. So we've got one o'clock to two o'clock, two o'clock to three o'clock, three o'clock to four o'clock. So typically, if we were to be using a traditional database, what you would do is you would just have a single index over all of that data, right? And that's great. It helps a lot. Uh, and you can even be pretty smart about that index where you, you know, first sort based on sensor and then you sort based on the timestamp. However, actually using a bunch of little chunk tables like this are really useful because it means that we can be very precise with the amount of data that we're caching, right? So let's say I just took this guy right here. You know, I only care about sensor three from one o'clock to two o'clock, and I know that in advance. That's where all my queries are going. I can just place this entire thing in our cache. Whereas, for example, you know, if uh, uh, our, we were just using a normal database, perhaps I would do a couple of reads that went in this range right here, and then we would naively cache this whole thing when we really just want this area in our cache. So the chunk table is going to help us a little bit more in writes and deletes, and we'll talk about that in a second, but this is how it helps us with reads. So how does our chunk table help us with optimizing writes? Well, for starters, basically, like I mentioned, every single chunk table is going to be maintaining its own index. So like for a given sensor right here, sensor one, we've got our chunk that is corresponding to it. Same thing with sensor two. And the really nice thing about splitting these tables up this way is that we can actually do something like keep this chunk local to the same node that the sensor is on. So that way we don't incur any extra network latency. Had we partitioned our system in a different manner where say you could have multiple sensors to a chunk, then you might have to write a bunch of data over the network. But by keeping all of these chunks local, we can make ingestions or writes really, really fast. Additionally, if we want to make writes faster, what something like TimescaleDB will use 
is use a typical LSM tree plus SS table architecture, which is fast because writes first go to memory. Go to memory. And then eventually they'll be written to disk and compacted and do all that fun stuff, which we've spoken about extensively on this channel. So again, we are getting the best data locality here because our chunk tables are actually on the nodes where we're writing from. They don't necessarily have to be, but this is a great optimization if you care about fast write speeds. And then the last aspect of this is actually going to be deletes. So the interesting thing, or interesting compromise perhaps, about using SS tables and LSM trees is that they're basically, when you're deleting an item, it is just as expensive as a write. So the delete would first go into here, right, into your table, and eventually it is going to be put into an SS table. And so you can see for the key C over here, we write that we delete it, and then in an older version of the SS table, we have the old value of the key. And then after we compact these two files, what we would have is that A is 10, because we're using the new value of A. We have that B is eight. We have that C is deleted, or actually, when you compact those, we probably wouldn't even have C in this file. And then you would have that F is 15. So the point is, whenever you delete a key, it's actually just as expensive as doing a write. And in time series databases, a typical use case is to drop data once it gets too old. And so we don't wanna have to drop a ton of data and effectively just write over it. That's super expensive and there are a lot better ways of doing this. So again, this is where having chunk tables is going to help us a lot. So instead, you know, let's imagine this is like our one o'clock range, this is our two o'clock range, and this is sensor A, and this is sensor B. This guy right here is just a bunch of files on disk. And so instead of doing all these writes to memory and letting them propagate to disk, we can pretty much just say, well, we can overwrite this data now. We don't care about it. It's free, it's overwritten, we just drop the table, which is a lot less expensive than having to do an equal amount of writes to the amount of data on that disk. So again, chunk tables, super useful in this regard. Deleting significant portions of data is a pretty unique case to time series databases. And so it is actually something that we want to be able to optimize or else that would be a super expensive operation. So what's our conclusion? Well, pretty simple. Basically time series databases will come up from time to time in interview questions and also hopefully in your career. Because whenever you have something like metrics or logs and you want to be able to store and access them efficiently, being able to leverage a time series database for its interesting properties that make both reading, writing, and deleting faster is going to help us a lot. Of course, when it comes to something like an interview, it's not enough to just say, hey, we have time series data, let's use a time series database. You also need to know how they work under the hood or else the interviewer is gonna call you out and you're gonna look like a bozo. Anyways, guys, hope you have a great weekend. I will see you in the next video and I'm looking forward to it.